So I'm Kim Howard, I'm your EAP account manager, and Karen asked me um, is, um, at the request of the staff manager to come out and talk with you a little bit. Um, we've been in the EAP for a while, we don't have a lot of usage from Brookfield, so I hope that you'll all take a look at some of the materials we brought. Um, we have lots of new resources, and we're going to toss the old EAP resources that are there because they don't even list a portion of what we have. The other thing is that I really hope people will talk back to me. I mean, I hear my own voice every day. I don't need to hear it for a, another hour or so. And really, what I want to get across is what we say internally at ESI is no matter what your uh, position is, you're in customer service. You're interacting with the public. It's not an easy job. You know, I think, I don't know if it's a requirement for a field or not, that you live in a town where you work at, but sometimes people in the grocery store are going to ask you a question about their tax bill or that kind of thing. So really being able to be helpful, but also to keep, you know, appropriate boundaries <coughs> as well. So we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about internal customer service, because truly that sets the tone for how we deal with or interact with the public. So how we treat each other is um, just as important, if not more important, than how we treat the public. So that being said, we're going to hope for no more technical difficulties. And Carrie has been wonderful. So today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, and I just want to let you know that we use these trainings with a lot of groups. So you could you could use a different word than customers, if, you know, if you wanted to. But who your customers are. Talk a little bit about how we communicate um, with those customers, both internal and external. Look at what makes um, good customer service. Um, you know, even when you try to do everything right, sometimes things go wrong. So we think about ways to reconnect with people after you perhaps had a problematic situation. And the last one I think is really the most one of the most important, but that you take care of yourself while you're assisting others. So really being, you know, able to say, I want to go the extra mile to help you out, but I'm not going to expose myself to unlimited abuse or the, you know, a way that people might be talking with you. You know when to set limits and or when to get some assistance from a coworker. And I'd certainly be glad to help talk about anything else that you might want to do. So just wanting to stress that every, it's every person's responsibility to work at creating a safe and respectful workplace behavior. And that means really, you know, extending the effort to help people that are coming in to ask for your assistance or the people who internally might ask for your assistance. Um, setting a positive example, not getting pulled into situations where people might be arguing with each other or they may be gossip or that sort of thing going on. And really, you know, not every person that comes in or every person that you work with is going to be somebody you feel comfortable with or maybe really like. But being sure that, you know, you treat them with respect and dignity and you don't get involved with making negative comments about them. So this is what I came up with for who your customers are. So internal uh, fellow employees in different departments or roles in the town. External would be res uh, residents, visitors, vendors, people that might come into the workplace. Would you add any other ones that I might have missed? So Warren Buffett, you can see it, he's obviously a man who's made millions of dollars. Cardinal error is made when we consider our customers to be the, the people out there. Excellence in customer service begins with the realization that those closest to us, those are in our work environment, um, are of the most important to the success of having a good job done. So when you think about your internal customers, the people may be the ones that are sitting next to you, there may be you know, people in different departments that you need to reach out to. If you really view them as, again, repeating, treating them as if they were people coming into your workspace, because they are, um, helping out when you, when you can, I mean, that really helps to set a positive work environment. 
and it helps people to feel you know, more successful in their job. If you know a way of doing something different, even if it's not your actual job, being able to share those things because you know we all have good ideas and we could you know maybe make people's lives a little easier. And also to remember that you know somebody might be asking you for help now or you may be helping somebody now, but you might need their help someday too. So really setting up that collegial um, uh, interaction. And saying thank you really goes a long way. I, mean, I think I was asked actually today, we're doing an internal survey where I work, and um, on employee engagement. But one of the questions was, has somebody told you you've done a good job in the last six months? And so, you know, I had to, because I just started my review, I could say that was true. But really thinking about that, you know, oftentimes we hear when there's a complaint or when there's a problem, but we don't hear, thank you, or that was a help, or I appreciate it, you know, what you just did for me. So this is, you know, everybody remembers the plane um, crash, but really it was working as a, as a team that got people out of that situation. So just to repeat, excellence and external customer service hinges on how we interact with each other on a daily basis. And we're going to spend time talking about communication, obstacles to successful communication, and service recovery. A little ways down the road here. So now you get to talk to me. How would you define exceptional customer service for the time of the field? Or it could be something you've experienced in your personal life that was not job related. Be responsive. Yes. Okay. So, go ahead. Because when people go the extra mile and, mm -hmm. they're, and they want to help you, and yeah. they greet you in a friendly way, and they, so many times, especially in the, you know, when you're outside in the store or whatever, customer service is lacking. And it's almost like it's refreshing to have someone want to help you and greet you and smile. So, I think we want to keep that in mind too. Okay. And I think, you know, and then what I've started to do now is somebody does that. Um, first of all, when somebody's offering me customer service in some way, I always ask their name. And then at the end, I thank them for it. And if I have the opportunity, I then tell their boss about it. Because I think, again, we hear oftentimes about complaints, but we don't necessarily get the reinforcement that we're doing a positive job. So good ideas. The way we define it is efficient needs get met. So there's not things hanging out there that people are not um, taking care of. You know, meets or exceeds expectations. Really finding ways to do things and to support each other is cost effective and time effective. And it, in general, makes the workplace um, more satisfied. So what do you think the benefit of delivering um, exceptional customer service might be, or the benefit or benefits. You build a rapport with your customers. They'll come back. Did you hear what you said? Build a rapport with, with customers. Go ahead, Brenda. Did you? You're I was saying well, when they do come back, they will come back with a chip on their shoulder. They'll come back and know their needs are going to get met. Yeah. Actually, that's, I was going to say that in another slide, because really, when you set in, um, every interaction you have with somebody sets a precedent. So if somebody comes in, whether they already come in with the chip on their shoulder or they leave with one, the next time they come in, it's pretty possible they're going to approach you the same way. So that's a benefit to you as well. So just said, develop a more positive relationship with, it. and I think that if people feel good about their interaction with one department, it may carry over into another department. They may be here to pay their tax bill, for example, but you know they might need to talk with somebody about something else. I think it's possible that it can carry over. They anticipate when they come back again that they're going to have a positive experience rather than a negative experience. So they don't come in ready to do battle, if you will. They come in you know, thinking they're at least going to be heard. And let me just say that this, that there are rules and regulations of your town that you can't change. And so, you know, that being said, sometimes if people even can feel heard or it's acknowledged that there's a why they might be upset about something. 
it can calm the situation down. You, you can't, you know, change when the tax bill is due, for example. But if you hear something about what's maybe difficult for people and you can offer alternatives or you know, someone comes in and is complaining they didn't get their information, you know, making sure their uh, mailing address is updated or their email address or so. Is there something that can um, ease the possibility that this won't happen, you know, again? Um, and again, if you don't have to be stressed, the work is a lot easier. So in order, you can't uh, deliver exceptional customer service unless you have customer service skills. And so we're going to talk about this moving um, forward by really being interested in genu genuinely interacting or assisting, uh, interacting with or <laughs> assisting people. Being flexible. There's not only just one way to do things. And we can really learn from each other. Um, I rely on my coworker a lot for her technical skills. I'm sure you could um, see this today. But there's other ways that I help her with her organization and things. So really being able to hear from each other. You know, understanding that you're representing the town when you're here as well. So you're not just representing yourself and your department. You are representing the town. Um, Self-motivation, wanting to do a good job, and communication skills, which we're going to move on to talk a little bit about. So before we talk about communication in general, I mentioned this at the beginning, not every interaction, even if you do you know, everything right, you've practiced all your customer service skills, there are some situations that are going to be conflictual. And so let me ask you this. Do you agree that conflict's a um, natural part of life? Okay, if so, why do you think a lot of people avoid it? It's uncomfortable. Okay, can be uncomfortable, yeah. I think there's some people that go out of the way to cause it. So. Okay, so they might not be communicating in a way that's working towards a solution. They're, they're looking maybe to cause more conflict. Okay, anything else? What I'm going to say about this, the conflict in, of itself, it's like stress. It's neither good nor bad. You know, it's a part of life. Stress only becomes a problem when it becomes distress. And that's when people aren't taking care of themselves and are, um, you know, not functioning in the way that they would like to do because of that self-care not happening. Um, conflict is only a problem when it becomes blaming or uh, disrespectful. I mean, conflict can be a motivator, it can be a way of thinking about different ways of doing things, it can help us to open our eyes a little bit. So, you know, again, if conflict is approached in a way that the goal is to work towards a solution, then it does not have to be a negative thing. This is not really part of this training, but I like to put it in here because lots of times, or, let me ask you a question, have you? ever said or done something and the reaction you got was not what you expected or what you had anticipated based on what you just said. Here's why. Because the issue that somebody comes in to talk to you about might not be really the issue that they, you know, might take them a while to get there. It may be that all of this other stuff or some of it, their personality in general, emotion, interest needs, desires, perception, self-esteem, expectations, and stuff from the past are all being acted on. Now, you can't be a mind reader knowing what people are going to come in to talk to you with and approach you with, but it's important to know what pushes your own buttons. And so, is there something about this particular situation? Um, is there something about the material we're discussing? What is getting you going that's setting up your reaction so that you can take the time to slow down your reaction, really understand what's going on for you, and get refocused on what, what you're talking about. And hopefully you'll both get to the same point where you'll be talking about the same thing. So communication, you know, we're going to spend the next portion of time talking about that. What prevents customers from paying attention to what you're talking about? Could be that pyramid we, we just saw. Could be something's going on for them in that day, or it could be a past expectation. Um, 
this is what your mother probably always said or your father. It's not what you say, but how you say it. So really being thoughtful about um, when you begin the process of communication, what is it that you want to say and what is it that's going to keep you on track to get it towards a solution. And really, communication is made up of you know, your words, your tone of voice, and your body language. And there's really studies that say before you open your mouth, um, people are always taking a sense of you or reading you and you know, starting to react. So it's important that if you're talking with somebody that your body language does match. You know, if you're saying, can I help you, but you really you know, have your back turned to somebody or you're not meeting them or greeting them, then you know, it really doesn't match and people are starting to react. So some of the communication barriers are just what I said, um, misreading body language, um, you know, really, and selective hearing or distractions. Let me just say this, we're all busy, and so sometimes when people come in, you might be in the middle of doing something, whether that's a coworker or that's somebody who comes in from the public. I think that, um, you know, being <coughs> able to either say to people, can you just give me a minute, and so that you can, you know, um, put a stop, you know, stop what you're doing, or let them know that when you will be available to talk with them can go a long way than sort of half-heartedly paying attention. Um, really taking the time to listen and understand what it is that they're coming to talk with you about, not interrupting. I think sometimes when we're busy, we think we know what the person's getting to, and then we, you know, try to jump ahead. Particularly if you think back to that pyramid, they may not even be yet at the point uh, that, that they wanted to discuss things. And, um, you know, just being aware that we're all, we all come from different places, so it may take a little more energy to understand what somebody's trying to communicate to you. So friendliness, you know, I think a smile goes a long way. It's really a hard, it's harder for people to be rude or screaming at you if you're smiling at them. And really, I mean, that's a fact of life. And really being greeting them, making eye contact. Again, you may be busy and you may need to say, I just need a minute. But you've acknowledged them, you've let them know that you're going to be with them as soon as you're able to. And by the way, it's the same thing if you're talking to somebody on the phone. Believe it or not, people can hear or smile over the phone. They can tell from your um, tone of voice, they can tell from your greeting that, again, you're wanting to assist them and really asking them how may you help them. So that opens it up in a more positive way. You know, your voice, I don't know if you've ever gone in and talked with somebody and they just kind of talk in a mo monotone or they drone, you know, kind of on. Sometimes that's hard to pay attention because there's not enough differentiation between what they're saying. But um, the flip of that is if you talk really fast, sometimes people can't take in what you're saying to them as well. So really trying to, you know, show by your inflection that you're interested, that you're slowing down, taking the time to hear what they say, and that, you know, you feel positive about wanting to help them out today. So active listening, you've probably heard th these terms before, but that's really being engaged in what's happening. Um, a big word um, in the everywhere is mindfulness now or being you know centered on what you're doing and what you're hearing and in a way that's really what active listening is too it's really being engaged in the event that's happening right before you um, really finding out what the people what your customer might know or need to know or what really they're looking for when they came in um, try, and again, I know it's difficult when you're working in an office and maybe somebody else doing something right around you, you to be distracted or the phone's ringing, those kinds of things. But to the degree that you're able to give your full attention, and if you do have to take that call, it's something that you've been anticipating, being able to say to the person, I will be right back with you, I do need you know, to do this. 
Um, sometimes, and I don't know, you might have uh, townspeople that come in who you know better than others who might take a long time to get to the, the reason that they're there. Um, it's, you know, you can't sit there for an hour probably listening to people, but really giving them some time to let them know, let you know what they need to do. And if you need to set a limit to do so in a polite way, um, I believe I understand what you said to me. This is what I think I can offer you. You can um, move on. So again, resisting the urge to interrupt. I and mean, sometimes we think we know what people are think, thinking about or what they need, and they may be dead wrong. So really giving them some time, also paying attention to your nonverbal communication, how you're holding your body, do you look like you're open to um, or engaging with people, and also theirs. I mean, you can tell how tense <coughs> it is sometimes, and maybe that's a person you need to take a little extra time with. And it's important that at the end of a conversation, there's <coughs> some next step there. So either you understand what they're looking for and you're able to provide it, or you've been able to maybe put them in contact with somebody who can do that. Now, an important thing internally that has to do with this is if you're transferring a call to somebody who is now hopefully going to be able to assist that person, that you tell them the person's name, you're tripped, but you also tell the person at the other end who's on the phone, why you're transferring it, so that they may do it anyway, but so that the customer doesn't have to tell their whole story all over again and get frustrated because here they thought somebody was going to help them and um, that person doesn't know. So I, I mentioned this at the beginning. The town has rules, you have regulations, you have things like that. You may not be able to change the situation that the person came in about, but showing that you understand why they are, that why they came in, why they may be upset about that situation, goes a long way. If you need to take notes, if you're, particularly if you're going to have to pass it to somebody else, so they have a sense of what the interaction was, and really again acknowledging the person, letting them know that you're going to do what you can do. Again, you may not be able to change the whole situation, but you're going to take the steps you can to make things um, better for them. And I think, you know, you'll find a positive result there. So, this goes back a little bit to, it's not what you say, but how you say it. So, you know, if you were working with somebody and you got the situation that you know you contacted somebody and said, I was expecting your report this morning, so far it hasn't arrived, is there a problem? How do you think that somebody might respond to that? Explain the issue. Okay. I think this explaining the issue is a, is a good thing to say. I would say this one's kind of a little net um, it be because is there a problem could just be in, you know, a question, is there a problem? If you use an inflection like, is there a problem, you know, then it, it can be heard or read in a, in a different way. But really the idea is to say, is, you know, is there a way I can help or can you explain to me what's, what's going on so that we can move forward together because Apparently, this information was necessary in order to have a next step there. So, you know, perceptions, you know, one of the first slides we talked about was when a coworker comes to you, there's a reason that they've come to you. They either need your assistance or, you know, they need some further information in some way. Um, and so, they may be in the middle of doing something, that's perfectly true, and you may feel as if it's an interruption. And so Mary here um, is being asked for some information, and her response is, yeah, I guess so. So really, that's not an enthusiastic response, let's put it that way. But if we go to the next slide, it's really, and she may not be able to say 
no problem, what's up? So the question at the bottom is what should you do if you don't have, do not have time and somebody approaches you for help? You can say give me a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. You can briefly explain why you can't help them now mm -hmm. and suggest a time when that would be good. Yes. Okay, well, exactly right. So here's the thing. We're not always able to be immediately available to people. It's, you know, we all have our own stuff that's going on. But being able to say to somebody, I'd like to be able to get back to you. I need to finish this email or I'm in the middle of this. Is there a time <laughs> today we could talk? Or you know, can you tell me a time that works for you? goes a long way. So it's not, not saying half-heartedly, yeah, you know, uh, I'll deal with you now. But it's really saying, this is what I need to do. It's recognizing, uh, Mary recognizing her own needs to get something completed so she doesn't end up hung up with something or losing some information. And then, but really also trying to give the message that I'm available to assist you with one of so, you know, I think going back to thinking about what pushes your buttons or recognizing within yourself when you might be riled up a little bit, when you, a situation is proving difficult for you, so that you can really identify um, what's going on before it gets out there into your interaction with your customer. If you come at somebody in an aggressive way, you're probably going to get it right back. And that doesn't really help towards solving whatever reason people came in for. Um, you can't convince people to accept a situation. They may still leave feeling disgruntled or that they don't understand why there's a rule or a regulation or something that you um, laid down. But you can say, to them, you know, I really want to work with you on this. I maybe can't change the outcome, but I want you to feel like you're heard or that we're understanding what your concern is. And the goal is to resolve any issue in a way that reduces conflict. I mean, it's nice if you can get to a solution and things are um, better or taken care of. Again, there may be some things that you can't control, and it's important to be clear about what those things are. I'm going to mention this again. I'm going to say it now, and I'm going to mention it again. There's some people you might know in the community and you might really like or, or dislike. It could go either way. And you may want or you feel particularly touched by what their plight is. It's very important not to overpromise what you can do for them, because that sets up in a sets up an expectation that you're probably not going to be able to fulfill, and that leads to problems, definitely. This speaks to this slide, so you may not know what the person um, is thinking about or, or feeling. You know, really checking back in with them um, and not assuming, you know, that you know where they're coming from. So this is being careful not to jump into a conversation, move forward before the person's ready, or um, leaving something hanging there that may need to be addressed. Um, again, if people feel like they're acknowledged, it goes a long way towards minimizing whatever kind of upset they might have. So what do you think would, um, if I were to take a poll outside of Town Hall and Brookfield and stop people that have come out, what do you think people would say was, was, uh, would constitute that our show really had a positive experience with staff? Their problem was resolved. Okay. Or people that go the extra mile. Mm -hmm. And if they can't resolve it themselves, they can search for an answer or delegate it to someone else who can help them. And also, uh, just as an aside, I don't know if you all do work this way or if you have somebody that's identified as a backup to you, if you know something's happening in a situation that you either don't feel comfortable with or you're um, feeling like it's escalated, but that could be helpful for, for people as well. So sometimes, you know, you can do everything right and 
something happens and people feel like they were disgruntled or they were dissatisfied. And so it's important to think about what's the next step. So do they just leave and that's the end of it or how do you handle that? Now, let me ask you, do you have any internal systems if somebody has a complaint or something like that, how that's handled? No. No. Okay. So, well, they could always file a complaint. Yeah, they could, and sometimes in the board of complaints, we do get complaints. Mm -hmm. We try to resolve them, and then sometimes it goes to the next level when people, we get, we receive written complaints. We try to resolve them, but as a general rule, people coming in, may not know who they're complaining to, I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes they do, sometimes probably they do without complaining. Yeah. Just wrong them out the door. <coughs> So, you know, we hear from the people, because we sent a questionnaire, as you might not know this, but um, the EMP for everyone who is service by us, we offer them an opportunity to review us. And um, some people do, some people don't. Um, it's nice when you get the positive, you know, complaint, I don't know, complaints, but it's nice when you get the positive reviews. It is true you hear from people that don't have maybe as positive things to say. What I do want to say to you about the EMP is if the complaint comes back, whether it's somebody phoned in a complaint, if it happens that way, you get a call within 24 hours from the, our, their, our head of clinical services because we take that so seriously. We don't want, I mean, it's our reputation, but also if people have called in for service, there was a reason they called in. So if you know we didn't meet their need, we really do need to hear about it. Unlike some people who just go away and don't ever tell us, that's, that's not helpful for us either. Um, also, I think that it is important to think about what else can be done. So, you know, with really being able to be kind to people trying to diffuse the situation, know when to end the communication. If somebody's really escalating and you've given them, you know, sort of a heads up, if this continues, I'm going to need to stop the conversation. You've maybe said that twice. It's like, I probably shouldn't use this example, but just like children, you don't continue it because it becomes a circular interaction where you're not getting any closer to solving whatever the situation is. People are probably just repeating the, the same things over and over. Again, you are uh, you know, representatives of the town, but you're also people, and so you deserve to be treated with respect. So if somebody is really has crossed that line, can't take the heads up to calm down, then it is time to stop an interaction. And whether that be asking a coworker to step in or a supervisor or you know, whatever would work best within your work situation, really knowing that it's okay to do that. And, and in fact, it's probably better to do that so that people, you know, again, don't get so escalated that they can't come back down. So, you know, we do this training with a, a lot of different kinds of groups, so all of these might not be appropriate for a uh, town situation. But if making an apology, if it's truly something you're responsible for, you can, you know, assume responsibility for that and, and apologize to somebody. Um, if it's not something that you're responsible for, you can say, you know, I, I understand it's difficult for you that this is the situation or this is the way that the uh, policy has been set up. You're acknowledging them, you're showing them some empathy that it's difficult um, what they're going through. Um, you may not be able to fix the situation, but you may be able to say, I'm sorry the communication didn't get to you. Again, can we check your mailing address, your email address, something like that. Um, I don't know what would be appropriate as far as is there a way to make this up to you, you know, the, the town situation. Again, offering whatever assistance you're able to give. Um, this is what I had just made reference to, is to really know your boundaries and what you're able to do for people, because if you overpromise and you can't fulfill that promise, that sets, us, that sets the situation up. Um, and follow up, you know, sometimes it may be a phone call or you see, you see the person again and come up and for a different reason. Is what we talked about, did it work out for you? Um, how's, how have things been going? 
And so a respectful workplace really begins and ends with each of you. And that's it. Unless I'm happy to answer any questions, whether about the EAP or if I can expound on anything that we talked about. Thank you. It looks very nice. So I know that a copy of this went to some department heads. I don't know if Karen told me that. So, or she asked me for it if I got on to the department heads yet. So feel free to do what you will with that. I know some of mine have taped it, but I know some people weren't able to come. I hope you'll take a um, look at the EAP materials. I do want to say this too, since I haven't been out here for a few years, but since I've been out here, we have new coaching programs um, which are open to you and everybody in your household. Um, a lot of people would never call for a counselor but would call to, for a coach and what it is is um, there's topics all the way from succeeding as a supervisor, preparing for retirement, financial coaching, um, balancing work and life, and you work directly with, they have to be counselors as well, and who are coaches, uh, by phone and email, and the coaches may suggest some of our online trainings to back up some of the things that they're doing, and it really, there's no set amount of time that you can work with a coach. Um, some people just need a few sessions, some people want to work with people, work, you know, for a longer, uh, amount of time and something else you may not know about the EAP is that we do offer all our resources to you and um, anybody in your household we don't care who they are in your household they can be a roommate it can be a partner you know um, don't care. you know so it, it's really a great resource and ways of Getting and the other thing, um, since I'm thinking, I know there's not a lot of utilization for Brookfield, so you may not know this, but if you've ever gone for counseling before, your benefit is actually up to six sessions. Um, so if you've been to counseling and you've paid copays, you know that can be a terrific savings. You also have a benefit for legal consultation, a free consult, and if you hire an attorney through us, 25% off their published rate. So again, there's ways to save money, you know, through the EAP. There's also lots of information about health and wellness, um, lots of online trainings, and new within the last year, a whole um, separate group of trainings that just have to do with financial fitness. And so really understanding your relationship with money, setting budgets, um, this is not wealth management, but you know how you begin to make your decisions about um, putting money away for the future and things like that. So I hope you'll take a look and um, take advantage because I'd love to say this. This is the one benefit you don't pay for. So this is totally off offered by the town. It's an um, add-on to your workers' comp. So there's no extra charge for, for you guys for anything. So. I guess everyone gets to go home earlier. <laughs>